you want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 27th of April 1998. Raw takes place tonight in Hampton, Virginia, while Nitro takes place in Norfolk, Virginia. And Nitro's a messy one this week. The NBA playoffs on TNT forced WCW to split Nitro into two parts. The first part was on Monday and the second was on Tuesday. So yeah, not great for World Championship Wrestling. This also means we see WCW guys competing twice this week and the nature of two Nitros versus one Raw means we're going to be doubling up quite a lot in the head to heads, but everything will get covered as always and we'll still pick a winner at the end of the shows. Over on Raw we learned that DX are planning something, Triple H tells Billy Gunn to put his bazooka at ease as he reveals the mission, D-Generation X are going to visit WCW Nitro, Hunter says the troops are going to go to the Norfolk scope to WCW wrestling, the enemy is near and DX are going to bring the war right to WCW's door. This this was absolutely insane at the time and it's a shame all people say about this now is it's not a tank DX have, it's a jeep. DX weren't messing around, they really were going to go to visit WCW Monday Nitro. Prime war stories tonight on Reliving the War folks, this is another memorable and special night for the WWF. You want to talk about special though, over on Nitro the first show kicks off with a Nitro girls dance. Oh Alex, I missed you so much. Bring that sausage over here and let's dance, baby. Two. Oh, big blood was. Alex rides back, folks, and he's here to show these Nitro guards how to really dance. God, I've missed this man so much. Security rush in to take Alex away, but you tell me, would you stick with the show that promised the DX invasion of Nitro, or would you stick with the show that included the return of a god amongst men? I know what show I'm watching on the 27th of April. Alex Wright appears on show number 2 also, so we're gonna get splashed with more Daz Wunderkind goodness tonight on Reliving the War. Tony Schiavone announces that Sting and the Giant made a challenge to the Outsiders for the tag team titles, so while that match doesn't happen tonight, it does sound like Scott Hall's on his way back to WCW. Randy Savage has also challenged Bret Hart to a match. Nitro's runtime has been cut down this week, so we have no unopposed R to contend with. Kevin Nash and Randy Savage are going to cut a promo on TNT while Owen Hart teams up with Ken Shamrock to take on The Rock and Mark Henry. Kevin Nash conducts the Scott Hall survey before confirming he recently spoke to Scott. The bad guy had a pina colada in his hand and his hair was perfect, and Nash accepts the tag team title match with Sting and the Giant. That one's gonna happen at Slamboree. Nash then says the wolf pack's expanding. There's Nash, Hall, and the newest member, Macho Man Randy Savage. And as for Bret Hart, the man who calls himself the Sheriff, Kevin Nash says he'll be Bret Hart's Huckleberry. Macho says Bret shouldn't have interfered last week and he's now in a lot of trouble. Hulk Hogan isn't here tonight, but that's okay. This is where it's at. It's all about the wolf pack. Nash then introduces the first defection from Hollywood's NWO, another new member to the NWO wolf pack, and it's Conan. Conan's left Hulk Hogan to side with Kevin Nash and Randy Savage. Arriba la raza! Conan says it's a pleasure to be beside Big Sexy the Jan Killer and he says Macho Man's a classic just like Coca-Cola and Corvettes. Conan says Hogan wants none of the wolf pack as Nitro moves on, so yeah, the faction's now beginning to truly form and I do think Conan's a good addition to this new group. On Raw, Rock says finally the people's champ has come to Hampton before the match gets underway. Owen and Rock get in the ring to kick things off but Kenny Boy wants a piece of the great one so Owen tags in Shamrock. Ken and Owen high five each other and then Owen kicks Shamrock right in his world's most dangerous man. A spinning heel kick then sends Shamrock to the mat and Owen grabs a steel chair. The bell rings as the nation attacks Shamrock and Owen closes the chair around Shamrock's ankle. The black heart pulmonizes Kenny Boy and it's so nice he did it twice. 
Owen Hart has turned heel, ladies and gentlemen, and for those unaware, Owen has not only joined the nation, but he's become the co-leader of the nation along with The Rock. Jim Ross confirms this next week during the nation's entrance. Steve Blackman tries to help, but he gets destroyed. Farouk also tries to help out, but he too can't overcome the strength in numbers. And it ends with Owen biting Shamrock and Owen draws blood. Owen said last night at Unforgiven that enough was enough and it was time for a change, so Owen's now got himself some backup as his babyface run comes to an end. Dude Love cuts a Love Shack promo while Chris Jericho takes on Chavo Guerrero Jr. This is the first of two Chris Jericho matches we're going to see in this week's show. He's back out with his shrine to Dean Malenko, and Jericho starts his promo off by making fun of Quasi Juice Guerrera for quitting last week while in the Lion Tamer. Speaking of quitters, Dean's here to answer a few questions. He gets a little nervous and he doesn't answer when Chris asks him how does it feel to be the number two wrestler in the world behind Jericho, and Dean also gives no comment when Chris congratulates Dean on becoming the new fry cook at Harry's Burgers. Dean can watch Nitro and live vicariously through the man of a thousand and four holds, and this upcoming match is dedicated to the Iceman. Chavo's fired up tonight and the crowd cheer when he hits a back body drop on the cruiserweight champion. Chris then takes a back suplex and Chavo's feeling it tonight, but Chris uses Chavo's momentum against him and we see a stun gun. Chris lays the kicks in in front of Uncle Eddie and you'd think Eddie was in Chris's corner by how he treats Chavo. Chavo tries to throw Jericho into the corner and the champ puts the brakes on so he doesn't run into Uncle Eddie, but a drop kick from Chavo leads to Eddie taking a bump. Chris kicks out of a small package, but Chavo follows up with a middle rope springboard bulldog, and then the match comes to an end when Jericho counters a flying head scissors with a lion tamer. Chavo tops out. Eddie confronts Jericho. He's not happy about the apron bump, but Eddie quickly turns his attention back to Chavo, and we see more tough love within the Guerrero family. Eddie says Grandma Guerrero's embarrassed once again. On Raw, Dude Love comes out with some groupies and he says he can see why fans get behind Stone Cold Steve Austin after last night's main event match. Dude is hurting a little tonight, but at Unforgiven, Dude Love took that tough cookie Stone Cold, he chewed him up and he spit him back out. After the dude put on a performance of a lifetime, his gas tank was running on empty. So when he took these ladies up to the hotel room, there was no action, he just wanted to be held. The groupies missed out and Dude Love missed out on the go. Stone Cold took the easy way out. When the chips were down, Austin resorted to a blatant cheap shot on Vince McMahon man. So the way Dude Love sees it, there's three options. We can bring back Shawn Michaels to find out who the real chick magnet is. Option two, WWF holds a tournament for the number one contender so Dude Love can get another shot at the belt. Or there's option three, Austin gets fired, he gets stripped of the belt and it gets handed over to Dude Love. Jim Ross says we don't know what's going to happen to Stone Cold but we will find out sooner rather than later. Tony Schiavone and the commentary team talk about a match that happened on Thunder, and man, this was scary. I'm sure you've all seen this before, and if not, it's one of those moments that's going to show you the real dangers of pro wrestling. During the match, Rick Steiner hit a bulldog, and this happened. Looks like quite the stinger, doesn't it? Well, no one really knows how this must have felt except Buff Bagwell himself, so I got in contact with Dallas Page and the guys at DDP's crib, and well, here he is. Hey, this is Marcus Buff Bagwell, and wow, a stinger it was not. Um, vicious and delicious against Lex Luger and Rick Steiner. Uh, man, it was a night I'll never forget. It was... Uh, like I said, a big time match, and we had a really, really good match lined up. And me and me and Norton had really good charisma, and you know, Rick and Lex Luger were big stars, so this is a big opportunity for our, my tag team. And so we go out, and um, and the finish of the match was um, Rick Steiner uh, goes into a comeback. I clothesline Lex over the top, which leaves me and Rick Steiner by ourselves in the ring. He slams me. He goes up to the top, and when he goes up to the top. A move I've taken a thousand times, which is the bulldog. He comes off with the bulldog, no big deal. Except nobody knows this, but Rick's shoulder was really bad. It was actually the shoulder was torn. So Rick went into that match knowing his shoulder was a little bad, but he didn't tell nobody. So he comes off with the bulldog, left arm always. And so I, I feed up for the bulldog like you always do, but your back is to a guy that weighs. 280 pounds. 
So he comes off left arm, and when he comes off, he misses me on the way down. And when he misses me, live TV, of course, I try to catch up to it so it don't look bad for national TV. So when, it, when I go down, I end up going toward him. I can't reach the mat, so my neck, my face goes right into his back, which my neck goes this way. You've always been told when you fall to tuck your head. Well, the reason they tell you that is because your neck can go this way a long ways. It can't go that way for just a little bit. So when I go down, my face goes into his back and whip, it whips my neck. You see when he rolls me over to cover me, you see that when he covers me, my legs are crossed. In other words, if you roll a guy over or a human over that's dead or hurt, his legs are gonna cross naturally because he's got no feeling in them. So if you look closely, you'll see my legs are crossed, which means I am 100% paralyzed as soon as I hit him. So my mind, before you guys see, I'm going, oh my God, I am paralyzed. There was no doubt in my mind. I'm paralyzed forever, instantly. So the finish of the match was he goes to cover me. Scott comes down, Scott Steiner. He comes down, hits Rick with a chair, rolls Rick, Rick goes onto his back. He gets me, puts me on top of Rick Steiner, his brother. One, two, three, NWO, NWO wins, Buff Bagel gets a victory, right on, everything's great. How it goes down is, I'm going, if you watch closely, you see my mouth, I'm going, no, no, don't touch me, don't touch me, guys, I'm, I'm paralyzed, I'm paralyzed, don't touch me. And I'm going crazy with my mouth. So, Scotty hears me, keep in mind again, live TV and 30,000 sets of eyes, and so, he hits Rick with a chair. I'm blabbing at the mouth. He, Rick falls off. Instead of grabbing me because he was scared of me being paralyzed, he just grabs my arm and drags my arm across Rick. He takes off, slides out, but my arm in the meanwhile goes, because I have no feeling from here down. And the ref don't know what to do because both guys are there and nobody's covered. So he go ahead and he goes he goes ahead and counts what the finish is supposed to be, which is a victory for me and the bad guys, the NWO. He goes at he, he he counts one, two, three, and really both guys are on the back. But I think my arm was kind of caught on his leg. So I know it was at least five minutes, but five to seven minutes it went to commercial break. When it comes back from commercial break, it really shows the slow mo where you can see the neck happened, which you will see. And then you'll also see in the slow and in, in the, in the playback, when it comes back live after the commercial, I'm laying there under the ropes. Virgil tried to slide me out, not knowing I was paralyzed. Or my legs would have stayed crossed the whole time. But when he grabbed my legs and slid me out, that's why I'm under the ropes a little bit. Because Norton went, leave him alone, leave him alone. So from that point on, you see kind of, you know, just unbelievable mayhem going on in the ring because here's Buff Bagwell paralyzed and I got Lex Luger, a great friend of mine, Rick Steiner looking down on me, Norton, all these guys were like super great friends and they're like, Norton's like crying and Luger, he's trying to call, and Norton's trying to call my mom and Rick is looking at me and he's the one that paralyzed me. So, I mean, it was brutal. So I'm, I'm sitting there trying to wrap my head around what am I going to do the rest of my life, man? The second part of Buff's story will be available next week. A big thanks to Buff and a big thanks to DDP and his crew for bringing Buff onto the show. Shivani says here on Nitro that Buff's just got out of surgery and an update will follow soon. D-Generation X have arrived at the scope and Triple H says DX are starting the war against WCW. This is the first shot. Check it out. Brilliant. Hunter says DX are the only ones with a sack big enough to fire the first shot, so WCW can suck it. The faction leave their jeep and they walk towards the front line. Hunter says DX will take no prisoners. Hunter asks a female fan if she thinks, not from experience, if WCW sucks, and she says, of course. She also says DX rules professional wrestling. Great stuff. 
Two Cold Scorpio and Terry Funk take on the Headbangers next. On Nitro, we have a Hogan promo and a Goldberg vs Scott Norton match. I thought Randy Savage said that Hogan wasn't in the building earlier on, but by god, Hogan won't miss this weekly promo for love nor money. Scrap that actually, Hogan would miss the weekly promo for money. The new WCW champion says that everyone knows Hollywood has done it all and Kevin Nash and Randy Savage are nothing but jokers. He says Miss Elizabeth's a slow, broken down ride as the crowd chants Hogan sucks, and Hug says there's no one left for Hogan to beat, there's no championship match that he can't walk through, the power lies with Hollywood. Everyone wants to know why Bret Hart did what he did last week and Hogan says even the hitman knows where the power lies, he's known since day one, when you're with the NWO, you're with the NWO for life. So yeah, another big load of nothing from Hollywood Hogan. Big Flash Norton thinks he can end his streak, and yeah, that's some big boys in the ring right now, isn't it? Norton takes the lead early on with a jumping shoulder tackle, but Goldberg won't be intimidated. The audience roars when Goldberg gets back up and the men get in each other's faces. Goldberg performs the spinning neck breaker, the match goes to the outside briefly where Norton gets the better of Goldberg, but Billy Boy fights back with his rolling leg lock back in the ring. Norton isn't out yet though, and the commentators are stunned when Flash pulls off his shoulder breaker. Goldberg kicks out though, and Norton goes for it again. Goldberg counters, we see the spear, he then gets Flash up for a jackhammer, and the destruction continues. Bobby Heenan says we're at 77-0, but it's 71-0. Goldberg defeated Mike Enos on the last episode of Thunder. Gonna be honest guys, I'm starting to find it more difficult to get into WWF tag team matches as of late, kinda feels like the stakes are never that high and the matches are random except for the tag team title encounters. The winners of this one do get a tag team title shot though, the competitors shook hands before the bout but then Funk and Scorpio cheap shotted their opponents, and they paid for this when Marsh came off the top rope. The headbangers kept the pressure on with a rocket launcher to the outside, but the middle aged and crazy Terry Funk went upstairs afterwards and he landed a moon. Salt. Scorpio decided he was gonna fly too and he landed a cross body to the outside. And then things get back inside the ring and the match gets thrown out after Terry Funk shoves the referee. Scorpio doesn't notice, he doesn't hear the bell ring because he's too cold. Marsh takes a power bomb and Scorpio hits an awesome moonsault. He tries to cover his opponent afterwards, but the referee won't count. The headbangers pull off a superplex and splash combo on Scorpio as the referee tries to stop the men from fighting. And there you have it, no official announcements made, so I guess there's no number one contenders. Thrasher takes a great guardrail bump before Raw takes a commercial break. DX go up to the front doors of the Norfolk Scope and Triple H wants to know if anyone got free tickets to the show tonight because WCW need all the help they can get to fill seats. X-Pac takes the megaphone and he gives a shout out to Kevin Nash and Scott Hall before Triple H says P-O-W-W-C-W, -W let my people go. So good. We have got promos next, Mr. McMahon on Raw, Bret Hart on Monday Nitro. Mean Gene says Bret Hart's the man responsible for Hollywood Hogan becoming WCW champion again and Bret says it's nice to be in the house that Hulk Hogan built. Bret says there's no room for guilt nor innocence in the world of wrestling and Bret found out that wrestling's just a long plastic hallway filled with pimps and thieves in a place where good men die like dogs. Brett says Randy Savage never had the guts to face the hitman and now all of a sudden the macho man wants to challenge Brett to a match at Slamboree. Well, Savage is half troll and half lizard, he's a lizard troll, and Randy doesn't have what it takes to beat Brett, he never did have it and he never will. Mean Gene does us all a favour and he asks Brett why did he do it, why did he help Hollywood Hogan? Brett's heard the question over and over, Brett says he wants to give Hogan his answer but Hogan isn't here at the moment. What the f- Hogan was just here 10 minutes ago? I think this is just a case of no one knowing what the hell's going on in WCW and the split shows have people confused. Either that or this Nitro presentation's out of sync and the order of the matches and promos has been completely messed up in post production. Anyone who was at Nitro on this night please let me know in the comments. Anyway, Brett won't say anything until he's face to face with Hogan. Mean Gene says Brett was screwed by another promoter and the hitman just done 
doing the same thing to Randy Savage last week, but Brett says that Ogerlin shouldn't judge him, nothing makes sense anymore and Brett's sick of sitting on the bench waiting for opportunities in World Championship Wrestling. According to Brett, he made an impact last week on Nitro and the Hitman has now finally arrived to WCW. This is where show number one ends by the way, the next lot of matches and promos we see on Nitro is from Tuesday night. On Raw, Vince McMahon comes to the ring and he says he's had to make some difficult decisions. Last night, Austin wasn't aiming for dude love with that chair shot, he was trying to take Vince's head off. McMahon has sustained a mild concussion, he experienced dizziness, but none of those side effects have clouded his judgement. Will McMahon fire Steve Austin? Not yet. Mr McMahon has plans, such as Stone Cold defending the WWF title tonight against Goldust, and McMahon then introduces the special referee for that match, it's Jerry Briscoe. If Austin so much as touches Briscoe, Austin's gonna get fired. Briscoe says he's an unbiased referee, Mr McMahon, and he's not afraid of Stone Cold under tonight's circumstances. Briscoe says he'll referee the match with the time honoured tradition of WWF officials, and Mr McMahon wraps it up by saying anyone other than Stone Cold would be better as WWF champion and that includes Goldust. Austin seen backstage and another innocent chalkboard gets vandalised on Raw's War. D-Generation X are trying to drive their jeep into the Norfolk scope but the shutters come down and DX won't be getting into the arena tonight. Triple H calls WCW cowards, DX are knocking on their door and no one wants to come out. The Outlaws bang the shutters and they say they want to talk to Eric Bischoff, and X-Pac wants a word with Eze too, he wants to give Bischoff a chance to explain why he got fired. Bischoff doesn't come out, there's no big DX vs WCW and NWO fight, it's been said a million times but it's absolutely true, if WCW let DX in and if DX stood in a WCW ring, then this week's episode of Nitro would have been one of the greatest shows of the whole Monday Night War. The Disco Inferno takes on Chris Benoit next, good luck with that. On Raw we've got Double J vs Bradshaw. Benoit has no idea what he's looking at on the other side of the ring, all he knows is this guy needs his ass beat. Hard chops are on top tonight as the Disco Inferno reconsiders his career choices and Benoit sends Disco back to the 70s with a back body drop. Shivani announces a 6 man tag match for Tuesday Nitro, Sting the Giant and Lex Luger against Bran Adams, Scott Steiner and uh, Conan? Yeah. Yeah, something's definitely up with the order the matches and promos aired this week. Benoit hits a pose line, he then goes for the three amigos but Disco stops the third with a few knee strikes and Chris takes an inverted atomic drop. Disco then fights fire with fire by getting vicious in the corner and he follows this up with a swinging neck breaker. He lands a middle rope forearm shot but Benoit's kicking out afterwards of course. Disco applies a chin lock, Benoit fights out, Disco takes another hard chop but Disco replies with a jawbreaker. Benoit dodges an elbow drop, he performs a standing switch followed by a German suplex, he signals for the diving headbutt and we see Chris's signature top rope move. Disco manages to kick out but Benoit grabs his arm and he goes to lock in the crossface, I thought this spot was good. Disco tries to get to the ropes but Benoit drags him back and the Inferno has no choice but to top out. No sign of Booker T in this match, though Booker does have a match later with Eddie Guerrero. On Raw, Bradshaw vs Double J is a short one and that's for two reasons. One, Jeff Jarrett wants to get out of the ring ASAP before Steve motherfucking Blackman gets a hold of him for what he did at Unforgiven, and secondly, Club Kamikaze once again interfere before the match can really get started. What these guys have against Bradshaw, I don't know, but again, Bradshaw takes the scent on. This time though, Takamichinoku runs down to the ring to help out and we notice a fourth member of Club Kamikaze in the ring. He's wearing a suit and a mask and Taka goes after him right away but the numbers are too much and the club do a number on Bradshaw and Michinogu. The question is, who's that guy underneath the mask? Backstage, Dude Love's pissed off, he says this isn't how it's supposed to be and he made him wear the tie dye and he told Dude Love to beat Austin. Foley walks past Vince McMahon, Vince wonders if there's a problem and when Dude Love says this is not how things were supposed to go down, Vince demands that the cameras get cut off. That confirms it then, Dude Love and Vince McMahon were indeed working together in the run up to Unforgiven. 
Chris Jericho has his second Nitro match next. It's against Psychosis, and we also have the Barbarian and Hugh Morris versus Public Enemy. On Raw, the DOA take on the New Age Outlaws. Dean Malenko's entrance music plays in the arena, but Jericho walks out and he's got Malenko's mannerisms down to a fine art. He gets in the ring and he says, My name is Dean Malenko and I want to go home. The crowd boos, but Jericho thinks this is some top promo work and I for one agree. Jericho had some good heat as the match gets underway and the referee helps by demanding that Chris takes the cruiserweight belt off before ringing the bell. The big move of the bout was this dive to the outside by Psychosis, but Chris turns it around with a released German suplex and we see the Y2J goose step. Psychosis hits a leg drop while Chris was on the middle rope and then, sorry, but we probably see the worst ever lion tamer in history. Not only does Psychosis fall on his neck from the top rope during the setup, but Chris also nearly falls on his ass while applying the move. Jericho retains once again though and that's all that matters to the bad mama jamma. Next we had a random tag team match, Hugh Morris and the Barbarian vs Public Enemy and yeah, I'm a hypocrite for saying Raw has tons of tag team matches that mean nothing because this falls into the same category. It started off as a singles match between Barbarian and Rocco Rock but interference from Grunge and Morris leads the referee Mickey J making it a tag team match. I didn't know WCW referees had such booking abilities. It completely devolves into a street fight but not a very good street fight, you've got trash cans, trays, all that stuff. Fair play to Hugh Morris though, he takes the table bump while saving Public Enemy from looking clumsy once again, but he also got some Rocco Rock ass in the face. This wasn't enough to end the match, the kick of fear to Johnny Grunge leads the Barbarian and Morris scoring the win, and we really need to get Ming and the Barbarian back on the same page. I want to see those two guys ripping people apart again. On Raw, I'm way more interested in what Triple H has to say before the Outlaws take on the Backer Michael Likers. DX have returned from the Norfolk Scope and we get the first first ever Triple H are you ready speech. And that's it, no talk about the trip to Nitro, nothing about banging on the doors at the Norfolk Scope, nothing at all, it's kinda weird. The Outlaws come out on little scooters as they mock the DOA, but the DOA brings some professional lifesavers to the ring. Hawk and Animal back up the dirty old assholes in this tag team match. It's eight ball and skull competing here, Road Dog takes a falling par slam while Billy Gunn gets rocked with a big boot. Double teamwork by the DOA leads to Jim Ross saying eight ball and skull deserve a tag team title opportunity and I'm not so sure about that one Jim. Billy's pile driver gets countered with a back body drop and Mr. Ass takes a back suplex. Hunter and X-Pac watch on from ringside as the DOA go through a hot tag routine, but it gets stopped by that Billy Gun pile driver. The DOA then perform the old switcheroo, the fresh man manages to roll over and Billy Gun gets pinned. The DOA beat the New Age Outlaws on Raw, but it was a non-title match. I'm sure a lot of you forgot about this dirty old asshole versus DX rivalry. These two factions have been fighting on and off ever since the DX army was formed, but you probably forgot about it because it sucked. The Undertaker vs Barry Windham takes place next on Raw, while Smackhead Kidman takes on Juventud Guerrera. Two quick matches here, the Raw match is interesting though and we kinda forget the guys Barry Windham wrestled during this WWF run of his, but we all know how he's been booked and we all know what's gonna happen. I recently went back to watch some Windham stuff from the 80s for another video on the channel and I was quickly reminded about how good he was. A kick to the midsection gets followed up by two punches from The Undertaker, the Phenom then ducks a clothesline, he hits Barry Windham with a chokeslam and then we see the tombstone pile driver. Match over, see you later. Taker grabs a mic and he says last night was only the beginning, his war with Kane is gonna continue and The Undertaker isn't gonna leave the ring until Kane shows up. Taker has all of eternity to wait for his little brother. This Taker vs Wyndham match was Undertaker's first televised match on Raw since December 1997. On Nitro, WCW play a Juventud Guerrera hype video before his match against Kidman so we expect Hoovy to win this one. Check out this snappy head scissors from Guerrera and this top rope sit down powerbomb by Kidman, fantastic. Billy misses his vaulting leg drop from the apron and he breaks his ass badly on the canvas. He tries a reverse suplex but Hoovy lands on the apron and he performs a springboard crossbody. Kidman turns it around by launching Guerrera up in the air and the landing didn't look too hot, but Hoovy made up for it by taking the hard clothesline afterwards. Kidman gets his wee choppy smashed on the top rope, we see a hurricane runner from Guerrera but Kidman stays in it, so Hoovy puts Billy away with a Hoovy driver followed by the 450 splash. 
flock members then attack Guerrera, Sick Boy and Pirate Riggs get taken out, but Big Horse Boulder and Reese's Puffs annihilate Little Hooventood. The crowd want Goldberg, they chant Billy Boy's name, but Goldberg has no time to help Hooventood Guerrera, come on. For five months, Alex Wright has disappeared from our TV screens and this week we get two doses of the big broad first. Alex comes out for an interview with Mean Gene Okerlund and oh, that's a fucking great shirt. Daz Funderkin says he's Alex Wright, worldwide superstar, treated like a king everywhere he goes. He went home for a vacation back in beautiful Germany, but last night he had to come back to this pigsty known as Norfolk, Virginia to educate these people on how to dance. What happens next? Alex gets taken away by security. And this is because the folks at WCW are idiots just like these people in Norfolk. Alex says no one tells him what to do, we see some Saturday ride fever, and then that no good, ungrateful clown shoe Doug Dillinger comes out and Alex again gets escorted away. Guys, if you want to win this Monday Night War, you gotta keep Alex on TV as much as possible. If there were 3 hours of Daz Wunderkind every week, WCW wouldn't have went out of business. Kane and Paul Bear come out to address The Undertaker next on Raw while Eddie Guerrero takes on Booker T on Nitro. So Paul Bear and Kane come out while Taker's still in the ring and Paul says this has to end, it wasn't supposed to be like this. It was all Paul's idea and Taker was the one who was supposed to burn in the inferno match, but once again it was Kane who suffered. Kane's been through enough, he was only 3 years old when the accident happened and it was Paul who went to hospital with him. Paul had to hear Kane's screams as doctors worked on Kane every day to tend to his burns and after the inferno match last night Paul says enough is enough there has to be a truce. Paul says Kane was once again set on fire, he saw the pain in his eyes, and then Paul drops this. Don't you understand? It was my son whose hand was on fire! Wait, what? Paul Bear is Kane's daddy? This is quite a lot to take in. Jerry Lawler thinks this is awesome as he comes to the realization that love machine Paul Bear knocked it into Mommy Taker. But yeah, Paul Bear is Kane's father and that leaves us with more questions than answers. On Monday Nitro, Eddie Guerrero has a chance to win the TV title and we think he's doing pretty well at the opening bell but Booker comes back with a shoulder block. Eddie gets animated as he complains about hair pulling, but our match continues and Eddie gets put down with a hook kick. Eddie performs a low drop kick followed by a suplex and as Eddie applies a chin lock, Tony Schiavone tells us that Bret Hart is going to speak to Hulk Hogan later in the show. Eddie moves into a camel clutch after hitting Booker with a clothesline. The two get up and Booker fires back with his running forearm shots. Eddie then ducks a spinning back kick and he brings Booker down with a hurricane rana. When Eddie pins Booker, he uses the ropes for leverage and it looks like Chavo's telling Mark Curtis that his uncle's trying to cheat. Eddie gets distracted by this betrayal and this allows Booker to perform a spinneroonie, followed by the Hardham sidekick. Booker then lands his missile dropkick and Booker T retains the TV title once again. Eddie tells Chavo to get on his knees so he can slap him across the face. I mean, yeah, Chavo completely deserved it. Imagine snitching on your own uncle. Triple H issues an open challenge next for the European Championship while Perry Saturn takes on Marty Jannetty. We have also got a DDP promo on Nitro. Before the open challenge, Goldust gets attacked by Dude Love backstage during an interview. Dude Love says it's my shot as he launches his attack, so clearly the Dudester isn't happy with Goldust becoming number one contender. So Triple H comes down and he's pissed off at the DOA. He says, and I quote, no one comes out here and kills my buzz. What would Triple H know about getting a buzz on? Anyway, Triple H is hot thanks to the dirty old assholes and he puts his European title up for grabs for anyone man enough to walk down the ramp and face the leader of Degeneration X. 8ball comes out to answer the challenge but Triple H gets more than what he bargained for when Dan the Man Severn beats Chains to the ring. Beastie Boy wants to add the European title to his belt collection and I'm all for it, let's go. Jim Cornette does not want the Beast to fight for some reason, I mean why doesn't Cornette have confidence in this man, it makes no sense. Cornette can't reason with Severn so he decides to smack him in the face instead, that wasn't very smart. Dan takes Cornette down and he locks it in an armbar while simultaneously choking Jim on the mat and that's how it ends. There's no match unfortunately and we now assume that Severn and Cornette are going to go their separate ways. Dan Severn vs Triple H could have been interesting though. So 
Over on Nitro, you don't have to be a genius to work out who's gonna win this one, and it's another throwaway match, really. 2 minutes and 15 seconds we've got here folks, and this is also Gennetti's second to last match on Nitro, so I don't know, absorb what you can from this. Hardy Marty gets his ass kicked in the corner and he takes a back elbow in the opposite corner. He then replies with a clothesline, but a light little shove sees Marty fly out of the ring. What was that all about? The action resumes with Saturn hitting Marty with a super kick. Marty gets caught in a tropping suplex. Marty's diving fist drop looks absolutely shit, so Saturn ends it with his new finisher, the Death Valley Driver. Absolute silence in the arena for this one. No one cares because there's no reason to care. Mean Gene then welcomes Diamond Dallas Page to the ring and DDP says he wants Raven to feel his Big Bang Theory. DDP hasn't seen Raven in the building but he knows he's around somewhere so Raven needs to get down and feel the bang. Kidman and Sick Boy head to the ring and Sick Boy says don't kill the messengers. Kidman lets Page know that Raven's recorded a video just for DDP and then the video plays in the arena. Raven Kevin talks about DDP's mother. Paige said she had three kids before she was 20 and divorced, but Mommy Paige must have despised Dallas if she let him go to live with his dad, knowing full well that Dallas would get shuttled from family to family. Deep down, Paige isn't okay with not remembering anything about his childhood, and Raven defeated Paige at Spring Stampede, so it's over, there's no more rivalry. So it's written, so it shall come to pass, quote the Raven nevermore, and I'm sure DDP doesn't want to give any thanks to Raven right now. Raven doesn't come to the ring, so Sick Boy takes a diamond cutter while Smackhead Kidman runs away. Things are getting personal between Raven and Paige and I'm glad the rivalry's carrying on. Kidman runs back to the ring to taunt Dallas when Paige leaves, but someone attacks him from behind. The commentators say it's a fan, but it's the same guy who attacked Raven a few weeks back. It's Chris Kenyon. Stone Cold says ever since he became champion, McMahon's been doing everything he can to get the belt off him, but that's not going to happen. You can be a special referee, a special timekeeper, a special jackass, it really doesn't matter to Steve Austin. No one will screw Stone Cold out of the championship. If someone can beat Austin fair and square, then so be it. But McMahon will never, ever get rid of the rattlesnake. From this, we get a Val Venus vignette where he seems to be in a lot of pain while sitting in his car. Either that or he really needs to take a dump. Val says good things don't come in small packages, and check it out, there's a doctor having a look over Val to make sure he's okay. I hope he makes it through, whatever's wrong with him. We've got Mark Merrow and Sable sharing words in the ring next on Raw, while on TNT we get another Goldberg match, Jerry Flynn's the next victim. Mark Merrow asks the audience if they want to see Sable and the crowd say yes. Mark says he too wants to see his wife, so Sable comes down to the ring, and Mark says Sable accomplished her mission, she managed to humiliate Mark Merrow last night at Unforgiven. Sable should be ashamed of herself, and this is what happens when Mark isn't in Sable's corner. Sable says she likes it when Mark is isn't in her corner and the fans seem to like it too. Something they're gonna like better though is when Sable puts Mero in his place and Mark wants to know what Sable's gonna do, is Sable gonna beat Mark up? Well, Sable says yeah, she's gonna try. Sable's had enough of Mark Mero, it's time for her to stand on her own. Mero wants to know if Sable's really challenging him to a fight and she says you're damn right. Sable only needs two weeks and then she will really humiliate Mero by kicking his ass on Raw's war. Can't wait. On Nitro, Jerry Flynn must be tired of getting his ass kicked by Goldberg at this point, but he's come up with a great way to avoid the spear. Just botch a kick, just fall on your ass and Goldberg can't do a damn thing. This was a great tactic for sure, but Goldberg just picks Jerry Lynn with an F up and he spears him anyway. Jerry didn't think this one through. There's a jackhammer right there, and that's officially 72-0 for Billy Boy Goldberg. The US champ is now easily one of WCW's most popular superstars, and watching the crowd react to his offense is actually really fun. Seeing Goldberg wreck people with the spear is also a highlight of the week for me. We end reliving the war this week with Goldust vs Steve Austin on Raw, and we've got that six man tag on WCW Nitro featuring Steiner, Conan, and Brian Adams vs Sting, The Giant, and Lex Luger. Bret Hart's also going to talk with Hollywood Hogan. Jerry Briscoe's in the ring ready to referee the Raw main event, and Stone Cold flips him off before the match begins. Briscoe's then all business when he explains the rules of the match. 
and he reminds Stone Cold that if he lays a finger on him, then he's out of here. Vince McMahon then dashes down the ringside as the match begins and he takes the timekeeper's spot. McMahon's gonna ring the bell tonight to signal the end of the bout and this can't be good. Stone Cold suplexes Goldust, he hits a body slam. McMahon eagerly sits by and he waits for his opportunity to ring that bell but it's been all Stone Cold so far. Briscoe breaks things up in the corner and Goldust hits a clothesline. The crowd rallies behind Stone Cold as the champion replies with a thumb to the eye and Briscoe fast counts when Goldust manages to cover Austin. Vince likes what he sees, Stone Cold does not. Briscoe challenges Austin to hit him and Stone Cold then notices Vince sitting at ringside. Briscoe gives a slow five count when Goldust chokes Austin in the corner and the challenger then manages to pull off a bulldog. The match goes to the outside where a fan pushes Goldust away and Goldust actually backs off from Austin. That lady's a lifesaver. McMahon gets agitated when Austin uses the guardrail to do some damage and Briscoe starts shoving Stone Cold. Goldust even low blows Austin right in front of the referee but the match continues on. There's a chin lock right there, Vince ringing the bell while Austin's in a chin lock would have been more monumental than the Montreal screw job. Austin gets up and he begins building his comeback, Goldust gets rocked with a hard clothesline and the crowd lose their minds when Stone Cold performs the Luthez press. Goldust replies with a sleeper, Stone Cold hits a low blow and then we see the Stone Cold stunner. Briscoe gets down for the count, he counts the two very very slowly and then something gets in his eye and he can't complete the three count. What a low down dirty dog. Dude Love then hits the ring and he attacks Stone Cold, yet Briscoe won't call for the bell. The match continues. Stone Cold gets thrown out of the ring, Austin backdrops Foley in front of the commentary table. Austin then destroys Dude Love and McMahon gets a closer look. When Briscoe steps in to stop the fight, McMahon accidentally hits him with the WWF Championship and that's how it ends. There's no referee, he's been bloodied up on the outside, so Stone Cold leaves Raw with the World Wrestling Federation Championship and he didn't have to put a hand on Gerald Briscoe. Briscoe, McMahon did that for him. A fun main event here and the shenanigans from Briscoe and McMahon helped to make it more entertaining. There's some big stars in this Nitro six man tag but you'll be hard pressed to find another six man tag that has so much stalling and so much time wasting. The problem is, every time someone gets tagged in they circle around the ring and they try to build anticipation for the physicality that's about to follow. The physicality is then kept to a minimum and another tag gets made. Rinse and repeat. Buffer's introductions and the entrances take up 6 minutes and we also get roughly 6 minutes from bell to bell. Brian Adams gets the better of Sting to start us off but the Stinger replies with a face buster and a scorpion deathlock attempt. This leads to Adams going to the outside and calling for a timeout. The Giant then gets tagged in and Conan wants to get in with the big man. He gets thrown to the outside, he stalls for a bit and Giant hits a body slam when the match resumes. Everyone loves a bear hug and a 6 man tag right? Yeah they're great. We then get Flexi Lexi and Scotty Steiner. Big Papa Pump poses and shouts for a bit. Neither man goes down after a shoulder block but give him credit, the crowd pops when Steiner goes down on the second attempt. Luger hits an inverted atomic drop, Scott replies with a double underhook powerbomb, Scott then starts shouting at the giant for some reason and then Conan comes back in. Lex takes out Steiner and Conan and for some reason Bran Adams walks away when his teammates crawl to the NWO corner. I don't know if this means Adams has joined Savage and Nash because Conan's joined the group and Steiner hasn't. I don't know. Stanner and Conan get out of the ring while bump boy Vincent gets chokeslammed into the ring. Stanner and Conan then walk away and that's gonna be a count out. And then there's Sting, I kinda feel sorry for Sting at this point. His title run was completely mishandled, the belt ultimately just went back to Hulk Hogan and now it feels like Sting's in danger of becoming just like his teammates in this match. Mean Gene once again asks Bret Hart why did he do it, why did he help Hulk Hogan and Bret says this. Shut up. New reliving the war soundbite just dropped guys. Bret says he wants to look Hogan in the eye and tell him why he helped him out so Bret uh, wants to hear those magic tunes of Hulk Hogan. What? Magic tune tunes of Hulk Hogan, let's hear bring him out. Oh, Hollywood, Bischoff and Booty Man come to the ring and Brett says he's been waiting a long time to say this. He wants everyone to understand that Hogan's someone who Brett's looked up to for a long time. Hollywood Hogan's the highest paid wrestler in the history of wrestling and nobody is more recognized around the planet than Hulk Hogan. Hollywood says he appreciates Brett setting the record straight and telling it like it is. 
Brett's about to tell us all why he wanted Hogan to be world champion again and he reveals a Hollywood Hogan shirt under his jacket, but Randy Savage then gets in the ring and he punches Brett in the face. So Hollywood and the booty man jump macho and they hold them up for Brett to get in a few shots. Nitro goes off the air as Brett gets ready to put Savage in a sharpshooter. Brett has to be infiltrating the NWO, right? Clearly, he was about to say he helped Hogan win the belt so the hitman could take the championship off him in a one-on-one -on -one match. Yeah, I honestly think this could have been the long-term plan because all signs point to it happening after this Nitro promo, but as always, WCW have a way of changing plans at the very, very last minute. Raw wins reliving the war this week, DX visiting the scope was such a big moment and it's still a huge talking point of the Monday Night War. Raw also had a better main event, Dude Love's villainous character also got better on this episode of Raw in comparison to weeks prior, and the fact that Nitro was split over two shows really didn't help. WCW had continuity problems and I don't know if this was an issue in post production but from start to end things aren't coherent unless you make stuff up in your head. Raw now has 62 points, Nitro has 55 and we've got 14 ties on the board. Nitro's airtime, the split shows and the NBA playoffs seriously hurt their viewership numbers. They got a 1.72 rating on Monday night while Raw broke their viewership record with a 5.7. Tony Schiavone mentioned that viewers would have to check local listings to see when Nitro would air next week due to the playoffs, so TNT were doing WCW no favours here. There's also no episode of Thunder this week on the Superstation. Join me for episode 132 and we'll learn more about the McMahon and Dude Love relationship. Jerry Lawler wants to find out more about Paul Bear's time with Mommy Taker, and the Big Red Machine faces Goldust in the middle of the ring. Nitro's once again cut down to two hours, but the Wolfpack is officially in the house and they make their mission clear. We see some physicality between Raven and Diamond Dallas Page, and the Steiners get back together? We'll see about that. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one and hit the thumbs up button if you did, it really helps out the channel. Take care, everyone.